So I'll start again here. Thanks for joining us for our fall long class. I'm uh, Trevor Cameron, our general manager here. Nicole is our director of marketing. She's in the background there. She'll do questions and chat. Uh, we'll whip through a bunch of material today and certainly have plenty of time for questions towards the end. Uh, I'm here all weekend, so you can come down and chat uh, mask to mask if you'd like to, or um, certainly email some questions. We can help you out that way as well. So um, I kind of start by confessing to everybody who's listening today, I'm kind of the OCD lawn guy. So don't think I'm standing up on my pulpit here telling you you should go green or to avoid certain products. I'm gonna talk about a lot of things today and hopefully talk a few of you into trying to go the natural way, the organic way, because you can have very nice turf um, and use no chemicals. You know, be safe for pets, wildlife, uh, kids, everything around the neighborhood. So, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll self-confess to start. I'm an OCD lawn guy. My lawn looks like a golf course fairway right now. So um, grass, you know, is always kind of an interesting creature if you, you know, watch Discovery Channel, different things on television, you know, we can trample it, eat it, flood it, burn it, do all kinds of things with grass. And what happens? It always tends to come back. Um, you know, grass covers a huge portion of our planet, uh, different species, but it's also, um, you know, something that's very durable. If we were all here doing the class, this is where I would have everybody raise their hand, you know, who let their lawn go dormant this summer? You know, some people want to keep their water bill down a bit, uh, maybe not irrigated, you know, on our, our grass, which up here, which is typically perennial ryegrass, uh, hardy fescues, a mixture of both, along with some grassy weeds we tend to get, um, you know, will go dormant. If we don't irrigate it in the summer, then it will usually pop back when the fall rains begin. Um, if you have let it go dormant, you know, we'll, we'll be able to get it kind of re-energized here as we get into the fall. Um, if you're going to keep your grass alive like me in the summer, it doesn't need an extraordinary amount of water. Um, people with sprinkler systems, I think, water their turf too much. Um, I tend to soak my lawn a little heavier once or twice a week during the heat of the summer. Rest of the year, you know, you're kind of on your own. We get enough rain here that uh, typically it'll last through. So if you keep that figure in mind, you know, one inch of water a week is plenty to keep the turf happy. Sometimes the planting beds don't even need quite that much. So a lot of times I'll just water my grass on occasion in the summer, but not uh, soak the planting beds as well, okay? Um, going green the natural way. Like I mentioned, um, you know, here at Sunnyside, I'm pretty proud that we carry a lot of natural products. We have some chemical or synthetic ones as well. Um, it doesn't mean one's right, one's wrong, but if you do, you know, kind of want to go green and go natural the natural way. Um, we do have options for pretty much everything here that we can stay on the natural or organic side um, for lawn care. Um, I'll just mention real quick, um, some people emailed before class about starting over. You know, I did this years ago, bought an old 50s house in Everett. Uh, I tried to do the quick fix for a number of years, could never get the grass looking very good until I rebuilt the soil structure. And if you're kind of in that you know, vain at this point, you know, I've tried everything. I can't keep it green. I got this, I got that. Um, you know, we need about six to eight inches of really good, well-drained, healthy soil to grow turf in. We don't need two feet. Um, six, eight inches is plenty. So if you're looking at, you know, reconstructing your lawn and starting over, the fall is a great time to do it, but we want to make sure soil is the key. You know, coming in and dumping two inches of fresh soil on top of your dead turf, and replanting seed is not gonna last long term. It'll look great when it germinates and then in one or two years, you're gonna be back in the same boat again. So if you are gonna redo it, uh, certainly ask me some specific questions, but um, it is very doable. And to me, it's all about the soil. Get a good, good three-way sand, compost, topsoil blend in there, rototill, pick rocks, add nutrients, and then off we go. Um, along with that, I would mention sod real quick. A lot of people will probably ask about, well, should I seed? Should I hydro seed? Should I sod? Um, you know, my opinion, I would always seed. It's just cheap. It's easy. We have great climate to do those kinds of things. Uh, it's very, very easy to germinate this time of year with the rain coming. Sod's very expensive. I think you end up with that fiberglass mesh, you know, two inches in your yard for all eternity. Um, and you inherit whatever the sod farm has. You know, maybe they've got red thread maybe they have crane fly larvae whatever's in their in their turf now you have in your turf so 
Um, I'm not saying it's the wrong thing. You know, if you want instant gratification today, I want my lawn, you know, sod is the option. But I would always look at seeding or even hydro. We head into fall, you'll have beautiful turf um, coming out of the winter for next year again. Okay. Um, I'll mention moles real quick. You know, this one always kind of makes me chuckle because moles, uh, some people's bane of their existence, other ones don't ever have them. I'm knocking on some wood right here that I have not had moles where my property is. I'm kind of up a little bit. I've been lucky. Um, but moles is, is a tough one. You know, it, it's kind of funny in the state of Washington, it's illegal to trap a mole. Um, but yet we can have traps here and all kinds of things. And I don't think the sheriff's ever going to come get you for trapping your moles. Um, I would always start to me with a three-step three step process for mold. You know, number one, uh, I want to get him out of there, apologize to the neighbor as he heads over the property line and go ahead and eat on their yard for the rest of the season. If we get a good repellent like Mole Max, you know, this is a product by Bonide. It's just natural castor oil. There's no chemical in here. Um, it works very well. The mistake I think with most folks is they buy that bag and they broadcast it over their entire turf area. Now, if I'm a mole, I got nowhere to go. You just surrounded me and now I'm just gonna stay right where I am. If you're buying something like Mole Max, try to do one third of your property, wait a week, go out another third, wait one more week, now we cover it out. And hopefully that mole goes from here to there to there. And then again, sorry, uh, Mrs. Jones next door, you get my mole from now on. Now we can try to keep that mole from coming back in. Um, second phase to me is eliminate the food source. You know, the mole is there because you want something to eat. So if we have grubs, we have crane fly larva, whatever it is, uh, broadcasting something out like that will eliminate the grubs in the soil. If he's got no food, again, hopefully he heads uh, across the property line to the neighbor's house. And then phase three is, you know, it's on, World War mole. You know, I got gassers, electrocution traps. I mean, there's all kinds of funny stuff I've seen people do. Uh, I couldn't tell you some of the things my father did back in the day to combat moles at the farm, but uh, there's a lot of options out there and certainly how kind of red in the face you are is gonna dictate how much time you wanna spend uh, trying to eradicate that little vermin from your turf area. So uh, we do have a great trap down here. If you've got the patience, be careful with your fingers um, and you can get them. But I would always recommend you start with Again, eliminate the food source, maybe try a repellent, see if we can get that mole out of your property and onto the, onto the neighbor's house, okay? Um, I'll mention mushrooms real quick because somebody always ends up um, asking about mushrooms. If we have mushrooms and turf, um, it's not the end of the world. You know, certainly there's plenty of poisonous ones out there we want to be careful of, but We just disconnect here. <laughs> there we go. It was your uh, your internet is going in and out. I bet everybody's on it today because they're stuck at home. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, so Constant 20 is a product that we could use to eradicate the mushrooms in the lawn. So that that's one that we could also use as well. Okay. Um, last thing I'll kind of mention. I hope everybody got the sheet. So I print up this sheet every year, I tweak it, I recommend maybe a couple new things on it. Uh, this is a great way to kind of attack your lawn and then we tweak a similar kind of process coming out of winter and spring. But I made this up specifically as an order of process. And I think a lot of people do what? They go straight in the fall for the bag of fertilizer, which isn't the end of the world. But if I have moss, I have weeds, I have other issues, now you just fed all that before the grass is gonna get fed. So I would always start in kind of this order, save yourself some time as you work on this process and you'll have great success. So if we start at the top there, 
uh, moss is always number one. Now, maybe some don't have a lot of moss in the fall, great. Um, I don't in my own lawn, so I may not do it this year. This is something for sure I'd watch for coming out of winter. We'll do this class again, like mid-March. But moss is number one, and I've really got two options on how to control moss. If I buy, we have larger bags as well, but if I buy a product like from Bonide like this called Moss Max, this is a nat, this is a iron, a ferrous iron sulfate product. So this is going to stain things. It's a pellet. I can open the cap. I can shake it out. Many people have used iron as a moss control um, in past years, but it's one that I can broadcast out and watch my mo my moss turn black very very quickly. Then I can rake it out, get rid of the debris, and I'm back to just turf. Okay. So that's option one. You've got to be very careful to me with the iron. You know, my wife could get me because I had orange spots on the driveway years ago. The patio, sidewalks, wood surfaces, iron will stain or burn places like that. I don't want to get it on my plant foliage. But once I put it down there, it's very effective as long as you're careful not to get it on those types of surfaces, you will not have any staining. If you want to go the natural way, this is a, another Moss Max product put out by Bonide. This is a potassium soap. So this is a product here that is liquid. I can hook this right onto my hose, open it up and do some spraying. The nice thing with this is what I use now as well is I turn moss kind of a straw color. Still works very fast. I'll kill the moss, but it also does other things. So the potassium soap will help me with algae, lichens, other problems in the yard. We have some people grab this, spray the back of the, the house, the RV. It doesn't stain anything. It's a very good cleaner like that um, to use in various spots around the landscape. Um, so if you want to go natural, we would go for this liquid form, the potassium. I, I wish they would package it in the concentrate. We've been asking for years, but this is probably the only way you're going to find it kind of in a ready to use spray bottle that I can do some area. This is what I put on my roof as well as we get to fall. I don't want to have any zinc or iron up there again, staining, dropping in the gutters, going into other areas. This is one that I can spray and feel comfortable about having something natural on my roof as well, okay? So that's Moss Max the liquid. So Moss is phase one. We've gotten the Moss kind of out of there, We've got it killed. Perhaps we rake it up. Um, phase two to me is always going to be weeds. If you have a lot of weeds coming out of winter or coming out of summer here, we would want to make sure those get controlled before we put uh, down our fertilizer. You know, I want to get the weeds, I want the moss out so I can clean it and then start from scratch. So for weed killers, a couple different options here. We're going to start at the high end and work our way down. So if we go chemical route, okay, this is brush killer. We sell, it's called BK32. And you would see this on the shelf and probably not think lawn herbicide, but brush killer does not hurt any kind of grass, okay? So it's a good broadleaf killer. It'll torch your perennials, your shrubs. I mean, anything it touches, you gotta be careful. But this would be kind of at the high end that you can use on a cage in your lawn. If you're fighting very hard weeds, horsetail, buttercup, things that you cannot get out, this might be the option to kind of get it out of there one time and start over again. So brush killer um, is one that will kill those broadleaf weeds but not harm your turf, okay? If we kind of do a little side note as we're talking about these things, really in, in all the world of weeds, we, we really only have two kinds of plants. We have plants that grow with one seed leaf, we would call them monocots, and everything else on earth is a dicot. So when we make herbicides, um, to attack different things, we have what we would call selective herbicides or non-selective. So when we're talking about lawns, you can probably guess, I want a selective herbicide. I don't want a non-selective one. If I go out with something, maybe you're familiar with Roundup, glyphosate, um, it's kind of getting on the cancer. I hope nobody is using it much anymore, but that's one. If I spray that out on, it'll kill everything, grasses, weeds, shrubs, anything it touches. So I'm showing you products today that are a selective weed killers that would not harm your turf, but would kill everything else around in the grass. So first one was brush killer. The second one is kind of another little higher end one called sedge ender. This is another one that would take care of a, quite a bit of those pesky weeds, the buttercups, some of the harder things. 
but I want to bring in kind of the second phase of this herbicide discussion. This is a post-emergent killer and a pre-emergent killer. So what I mean when I say that is, if my weed is grown out of the soil, I use a post-emergent weed killer. I spray something on it, it kills it, it shrivels, it dies to the root. If I want a pre-emergent, that means I have no weed out of the soil yet, but I want to create a film or a barrier on the soil surface that weed will not grow through. So this is both. This isn't one you got to be real careful with, to be honest with you. If I've got a weed-free lawn and I want to keep it that way, some of the golf course folks beyond my OCD, because I go kind of natural, might use something like this to keep anything from growing in the first place. What do you got to be careful of when I said pre-emergent? We're going to talk about overseeding and rejuvenating our turf. If I put this down, I can't plant grass seed. You know, I've got to wait three months. So this is, to me, something maybe you're not going to use in the fall unless you already don't, unless you don't need to reseed. Maybe you do this coming out of winter, next spring, after you've seeded, got your new grass to germinate, then I could apply something like this and have great results. So that sedge ender would be both pre and post emerging. Now, if I want to go <clears throat> kind of the traditional route, um, a lot of people are familiar with something like Weed Be Gone, Ortho, the box stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, I think they all carry Ortho products. Uh, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but <clears throat> it's an old school formulation. It is chemical, it is very, very effective, but it works only in high temperatures. So we're still warm enough here in late summer that you might have luck with something like that. We choose to carry uh, something from Bonide called Weed Beater Ultra. This is a product it works down to 45 degrees. So to me, I'm trying to attack my weeds later fall, early spring, a product that I can have in the garage if I want to go the chemical route and have very good effectiveness in cooler weather. And this is the time of year, say you don't get to this for a month, I don't know that you're going to get a lot of action out of a product called Weed Be Gone. We would want to use Weed Beater Ultra. This does a, a huge number of broadleaf weeds. Yes, if you've left your dandelion there for two years and the taproot is twice the size of a carrot, you're probably going to have to get it a couple times. If you have clover, you know, things with waxier foliage, you might have to get it a couple times. But just as a good general spray that I can walk around and spot spray in my turf, Weed Beater Ultra is a, a great choice if, if, if you go the chemical route, okay? The last one I'll show you is this is what I use here. and This is because I, I go natural in my own yard. This is also underneath that same weed beater label. This is weed beater FE. So any of you chemists out there know FE, we just mean iron. This is a great natural weed killer that just contains HDTA iron. It's very effective. This is all I've ever used, probably going back 10 years now. The only thing it doesn't do very well on is clover and oxalis. So those two, I get the screwdriver out and try to pop them before they go to seed and I don't have the clover take over. But dandelion, spurge, chickweed, I get on and on and on. This is a great um, a spray if you want to go the natural way. Because it's iron, guess what? It also does moss. It also cleans algae. I mean, then go on and on. This does a lot of things around the landscape uh, safely. And all this iron does to my grass is turn it dark green. Grass has got the ability to absorb a large amount of iron, whereas other plants don't. So yes, I don't spray this on my perennial beds. I'm not gonna get this on my flowers, shrubs, trees, other things that will do some damage. But in the turf area, I spray that off and on. Very, very effective uh, natural way to kill weeds. I have this, honestly, in my garage. You know, I don't wanna mix it. I don't need a lot of it. I've only got a couple thousand square feet of turf. So this is that Weed Beater FE in a ready to use gallon. I keep it in my garage. I can shut it off, pull the trigger out walk around for 10, 15 minutes and spray the five or six little weeds that might have blown in in the wind and I'm done. Put it back on the shelf, bring it back out. I think I use one of these bottles about every two or three years now. So very, very easy once you get caught up to maintenance with something like the Weed Beater FE, okay? Now, before we stop talking weeds, I just wanted to show this turbo spreader sticker. I appreciate a lot of folks sent some emails um, before the class and a lot of it had to do with weeds. How do I kill this? I'm not having luck with this. The, the problem a lot of times is getting that herbicide 
whether it's natural or synthetic, to stick to the foliage. We mentioned clover, very hairy, very waxy foliage. It's hard to get a drop of chemical to stick to that, burn the foliage and, 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 and do its job. So if we get something like turbo spreader sticker, this is an adhesive and a jugant, almost think of it as like glue. I put a little bit of this into my spray mixtures, whether I'm doing weeds or anything, honestly, it is going to stick it to everything and make it more effective. So if you go the chemical route, it's fine, but maybe add something like this because you're going to use much less chemical and make it twice as effective by gluing it to whatever you're spraying it to, okay? So turbo is something to consider. We saw an awful lot of this with a lot of our spray mixtures and it's, it's a very good way to go. Um, the last one for herbicide, you know, is your golf course. So if you look at this bag product, this is Weed Beater Complete. So this is everything in one. We mentioned with the said gender, the liquid, about post-emergent and pre-emergent. This is a granular that you would use if you're, if you're going for the golf course quality lawn and you don't mind using chemical. This does everything in one. So again, being pre-emergent, I gotta be real careful. I can't seed. I have quite a few customers that use that in the spring, but after they've overseeded, got their grass to germinate, now I can go back and apply uh, something like that as a pre-emergent. I don't have to worry about it. If I put that down right now, I cannot broadcast seed or it will not grow here going into winter. So just be real careful with, with something like granular or any of the pre-emergents for that matter, okay? So that's a little bit about weeds. Um, we'll mention thatching and aerating here real quick. Now this isn't for everybody. I'm gonna duck out here for one second. I'll show you my weapon here. This is what I call the Conan weapon. If anyone likes Conan the Barbarian, old Arnold Schwarzenegger. But this is a pretty lethal rake. Looks different, maybe some of you have one. Um, it's a tool for thatching. If I run this around my lawn and start raking in different directions, A, it's very hard work. Uh, you're gonna get your shoulders a little bit. Um, but B, I'm removing all of that old dead grass, the clippings, uh, the moss, if you haven't raked yet, anything that's in there, if you've done this, you know what I mean. And you would be shocked how much junk comes out of your lawn. And you're like, what have I done? I'm looking down at dirt, grass. I've got a mixture of both. It's a great thing. I mean, if you thatch properly, you know, I've got a typical yard waste, you know, huge bin in City of Everett. I might pack that thing three straight weeks with just lawn debris in the spring. If you haven't done it, fall's a great time to aerate as well, um, but spring or fall. I always do it in spring. Sometimes I don't think I'll have to this fall because the turf looks great, but at the most twice a year is plenty. Um, I tend to focus again on doing it coming out of winter, but it's, it's worth uh, mentioning here in the fall class. So thatching is part of it. Again, moss is killed, weeds are done. Now I can get rid of all that old debris, old grass, weak grass, all that will come up and now I can kind of start from scratch, okay? Uh, aerating <clears throat> is, well, before I finish thatching, um, you know, I'll rake a lot of times, but you can also have services come do this for you with a power thatcher, which will really work well. Um, I, this is the first year for me, I said no more shoulder pain. And I went and rented one up at Pilchuck here in Marysville, you know, cost me 60 bucks. I was done in an hour, you know, doing three lawns. And that's got power thatch, so I'm taking everything out. Then I just have to go back and rake light fluff, uh, get it out of there, and, I, and I'm back to square one again. Um, aerating was the second part of this. And I don't know that I've never had to aerate in my own lawn. Some people do. Um, to me, aeration is all about soil compaction. If you tried, <coughs> excuse me, tried to keep your lawn green this summer, and you watered and you watched it run off and maybe it's on a slight slope, whatever the case, but you could not get water to penetrate and keep that grass green, you've probably got compacted soil that might need to be punched. You know, I try to be a golfer, but if we think about the golf course, what do they do? They aerate everything in spring, aerate it in the fall. I want to remove old crowded grass roots top dress with fresh compost and fill and have brand new areas for that turf to reestablish and be happy again. So I'm not telling anyone to run home and go get an aerator. I've seen shoes that work okay. There's all kinds of options. 
it's not for everybody. You know, I would look, think of your own lawn. Did you try to keep it green? Water ran off? Yes. So maybe you want to think about aerating either this fall or coming out of winter. You'll probably have a lot better looking grass come next term. The second part of that is the plugs. If you aerate, you're going to have those little core plugs everywhere. Do not leave them on the grass. Part of this is about getting rid of that old debris. So if I aerate, I want to rake all those plugs and get rid of them. I don't want to leave them on my grass. I'm going to end up with bumps and valleys and dips. And now you've got all that root matter and old dead grass sitting right on the soil surface. It's going to inhibit the rest of the lawn from growing. So always get rid of the plugs out of the property. Then we can go back and fill uh, top dress and get, get the next phases going. Okay. So thatching and aerating are next. And part of that is that step four, you know, top dress. Um, and overseed. So if I'm going to top dress my lawn, uh, I'm going to fill plug holes. If I aerate, I'm going to need more soil. If I don't, I, I just want to top dress it with pure compost. And overseed, you know, for us is what everybody tries to do here in the fall. <coughs> Again, moss gone, weeds gone. I've got some dirt. Maybe I thatched, maybe I didn't, but I still want to do some overseeding to fill that grass in nice and thick for winter. This is a generic brown plastic bag because we package our own here, but this is what the only thing we sell is called Seattle Shade and Sun. It's a great local mixture, uh, does well for shade, does well for sun, wet, any spot in your yard. It's a nice mix of perennial rise and fescues that will tend to match what you already have in your lawn area. So if I use that as my overseed, I just need about a pound or two for every thousand square feet of turf. If I have no lawn, if we go back to the beginning and say I'm starting from scratch and I want to seed it, then I would get more like five or six pounds per thousand square feet. Now I hand sprinkle, you know, I don't get, you can use one of these if it's a big area and broadcast your seed. I don't like doing that because I end up with grass growing out of the edge of my beds. Sometimes maybe a hand sprinkle the border and go back and do your, your little spreader down the middle areas. But it's not, it doesn't take as long as you think to take a bag or dump your seed into a little bucket and just walk towards the back and try to do a little bit of overseeding. I like by hand because I can do more in some areas that are really bare and other areas that are thick and lush, I don't need very much at all. So I can kind of adjust as I go um, doing the overseed, okay? So top dress, again, if I fill the plugs, and if I'm going to overseed, I'm going to put that down now because all my moss is gone, weeds are gone. If I've thatched, that's out of there. But now I've got empty space, I can do my overseeding. Now I can get to what we talked about at the beginning and I can get my food down, my lime down and get a little seed cover or top dress over that whole mess, okay? So we've done the seed, the next phase is fertilizer. And I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time talking about different brands and this and that. Um, I only use organic lawn food, and frankly, that's all we sell at Sunnyside. Um, I don't like the synthetic chemical brands, not to pick on Scott's or any particular brand, but if I could ban one thing on earth, it would be the weed and feed. If you're going to use chemical, you know, get some spray and spot spray. You don't need to put that poison over your entire property when you just needed to spray one weed here, one weed there. Um, get it sprayed by hand instead of just broadcasting that chemical over everything. Now we got issues with pets, people, kids, wildlife, everything. If we go organic, we're building the soil again. You know, we're, we're pr I'm, I'm proud personally to convert many of you over the years to going organic. And it makes me very happy when you come back and say, man, I did what you told me last fall. My lawn looks unbelievable this year. And I feel really good about walking out with bare feet, my kids playing in it my dog going out to, to do his thing, whatever, you've got um, healthy turf, you know, healthy natural turf instead of this chemical mess. All that herbicide goes straight to the groundwater, the creek, the lake, the river, the sound. I just, I, I hope people make it, you know, kind of think, hey, I could try it that way. I think you'd be pretty pleased uh, using organic. So our organic fertilizers, typically we have uh, two brands around here. EB Stone, Nature's Green is our number one selling really product in the whole store and it's a great lawn food. Uh, with everything happening with COVID this year, uh, there's some issues right now with lack of packaging and material. So we'll have it again here in just a couple weeks, but we have our second brand in. 
which is just as good, <clears throat> another all organic company. This is made by Espoma, another family company on the East Coast, but it's a great natural lawn food. You can see the beautiful picture. We got the boy playing with his dog right there in the grass, and that's what it's all about. So if I use an organic food, um, number one, I don't have to worry about ever burning my seed. You know, we, we talked about in the last step, we throw our seed down. I'm going right back with fertilizer and putting it right on top of the seed. I'm not going to burn anything. If I used a turf builder or another synthetic food, I could not because I would torch the seed. It's too much nitrogen. So a, a nice gentle organic lawn food, I think you will find will give you a nice gentle growth, a solid great color all year long. And I only have to put it down once in spring. I do once about midsummer and once here in a few weeks going into fall and that's it. I've got the same color turf, nice and healthy grass. I don't have to mow that much. If you think about your synthetic foods, what happens? You go, you buy that bag of cheap turf builder down at Lowe's, you pump it on there. Oh my God, it turns dark green. It grows five inches in a week. I got to go mow it three times and then I crash. Then I put another bag down and then I go through this non-ending cycle of A, too much mow time. And it just grows regularly all the time. If you go organic, you're going to see that nice, gentle, easy growth habit, the good emerald green color, and again, feel real good, real good about healthy, healthy soil, healthy lawn for everybody, okay? So lawn food, we'll move on from that, but we've got seed down now. We've got lawn food down, a good organic fertilizer. Phase three is lime. Now, if you haven't used lime before, you know, I found this brand a few years ago. This is made by Espoma. It's called lightning lime, got a great name to it. But this is a great application of lime that I will always do spring and fall. This is one thing I do every year, this time of year when the rain starts. And then again comes spring. I wanna make sure you gotta, if you were here, I'd make it repeat after me. Lime is not a moss killer because everybody, half the people think I tell them that lime will kill their moss, it does not. That's a natural calcium product. And if I put that in my soil, I'm raising the pH a little bit. Everybody in gardens here knows we have a little bit of acidic soils. Moss loves acid soil, grass does not. So if you can get your pH up of your turf areas, you're gonna see a huge reduction in the moss growth and a lot better grass growing areas, if that makes sense. You know, speaking for me from experience in my yard, you know, I had 100% moss, you know, 15 years ago, every year, a whole lawn, sun, shade, everywhere had moss. Now I'm down to coming out of winter every year to where it should be to me, maybe the wetter area, the shadier area, so I can just kill a small portion of moss, rake it and be done. I don't have to do the whole lawn anymore. But if you get in the habit of adding this lime, you're going to get your pH up into that neutral or slightly alkaline range just in your turf. You're going to have happier grass and the moss will not be as prolific, okay? So those three things, we've got seed down, we've got food down, and we've got lime down. Now we want to do a little bit of seed cover. So now we want to protect our investment. Not a lot of money, but it is some time, you know, to get these things done. I want to protect it. I don't want the birds eating all my seed. You know, you guys know as well as me here in Western Washington, we've got very irregular weather. Are we gonna have an Indian summer? Is it gonna start raining? Is it gonna be hot in October? You know, it's always kind of year to year is a little different. If I seed and do all this, I have to keep my seed moist. I'm not gonna flood it. I don't wanna overwater it, but I cannot walk away. You know, you do this in a month, it's gonna start slower, but maybe I don't have to worry about the irrigation as much, but I need to be a, available to cover this seed, keep it moist, and water it on occasion on a daily basis. With the sun out and no rain, it has to be slightly watered every day. You got a sprinkler system, great. Turn it on just for a couple minutes in the morning, maybe a couple minutes in the afternoon. It'll keep that seed cover moist. The grass will germinate with the warm temperatures. It's gonna grow very quickly. A couple weeks, I got peach fuzz. One month, you probably got perfect turf, and off you go for the winter. If you don't have a sprinkler system, you know, I tend to take my hose out very carefully and not dragging it across to destroy my hard work, but that or an oscillator. Maybe I put a sprinkler up and just again, a, a couple minutes morning, couple minutes in the afternoon or when you get home from work, I'm making sure it doesn't dry out. 
the two things we do for seed cover, if you can see behind me, I've got planting compost. This is our all-purpose planting compost we use for everything here. You know, planting trees, shrubs, perennials. I use that all over the garden. It also makes great seed cover. If I buy these bales, this is a compressed brick or a bale, it's 2.8 cubic feet. If I have one of those, I'm going to cover about 400 square feet of seed, like clockwork. My yard's just under 2,000, and I use five of those in the fall and five in the spring for years, just like clockwork. So that's option one. I get good compost, and I cover that area. You don't need to buy a lot of it. We've always got that on special. Buy four, get one free. You know, that's an easy one to take home in the fall. You got some extra. <coughs> Excuse me. Save it behind the house. Use it for planting shrubs and trees. Great amendment. Kind of the specific one, you can see through the bag here, it's a nice bright blue. Actually, I'll show you that because I think this is a great package. I'll hide me with it. That's top coat, okay? You can see the nice man in his fire engine red shirt running his mower there, okay? So top coat is, again, all organic. It's the same idea. I'm going to use that in lieu of compost. The only difference is that's screened to a finer grade. So if you really want to get fine compost down, kind of like old peat moss was, that's the way to go. The top coat's a cubic foot and a half bag. So again, I need about one of those for every 200 square feet of uh, seed cover. And either one of those works great. I, I've used both. Typically, I go more compost just because I use it for everything. But I have used top coat as well. And it, it's the same beautiful black all organic compost, just a little bit finer grade if, if, you don't, if you don't want as much wood on it, okay? So we've got that seed cover. Now we're in business. The little birdies aren't gonna steal it from us and hopefully that'll give me a little insurance that if I'm gone for the day, I'm not gonna have it dry out so I have to go back and seed and feed and do all that business again, all right? So last couple things here, I'll mention uh, diseases. Now, uh, this is a tough one. Uh, to, as we get into fall, as we talk about different thatch diseases, we mentioned thatching. If I get rid of debris, I probably cut my chance of a lot of thatch disease down substantially. But as we get into winter, it's everywhere. I mean, I've come home, you know, from golf courses years ago, and I could watch my footprints of where I put red thread through my lawn when I got out of the car. I mean, there's a lot of ways this is transferred. And when, as we get wetter, that's what happens. That's why I try not to water in the evening or at night and keep it wet all night. If you can water early in the morning, let it dry out, you're going to have a lot less fast disease. But, you know, red thread, dollar spot, rust, I mean, we can go on and on about different things that might get in our turf. They're all correctable. Um, to be honest with you, I hardly spray or apply, I never apply a chemical, but I even hardly spray anything synthetic. If I feed my turf, the grass grows right through it and it's okay. I mean, this happened to me in spring, was getting a little red thread here and there, put some lawn food down, coming out of winter, grew green, haven't seen it since. Now, honestly, it will be back this fall. If I can live with just a little bit of browning here and there over the winter, I can do the same thing in spring, okay? But if I wanna treat it or give myself a little, you know, get rid of it out of my grass, the couple options are, Again, I use a, a, a chemical product like Infuse. It's not the end of the world, this is chemical. It's very effective for turf diseases. What I would tell you is make sure you get it down on a day, keep your pet, your kid, whatever, out of the grass for that day. Once it has a chance to uh, do the thatch layer, get down into the grass and hit the soil, then I'm okay. Um, so as long as you read the instructions and do it properly, you'd be okay, but it is chemical. This is a systemic, turf application. I'll kill all those diseases um, with, with more, of the, more of the synthetic route, okay? If you want to go with something natural, I've been playing around with all kinds of things. Neem oil, um, I didn't bring in here. It tends to be a great uh, suppressant for a lot of things. Um, and I know it's not listed, um, all of the products I've seen for specific turf diseases, but it has worked pretty well for me if I keep up on it. I can't just go out once in the fall and spray something natural and say, ooh, I'll be all set. I need to get it now in a couple weeks and maybe a third time. And then again, repeat this process in spring and I can probably eradicate it that way. I mentioned neem oil. This is the other one that I'd look at. This is a 
what we would call biofungicide, which sounds like nuclear death, but it's really not. This is an all natural product uh, made by Boni that works on everything. I have some folks take this home and spray their shrubs, roses, trees, vegetable garden, lawn. You can put this all over your property and not hurt anything. This is a bacillus, a natural bacteria in solution that eats fungus. So if I keep up on this, you know, any disease has to blow in the wind and land on a wet surface to germinate, propagate, and then start, start taking effect. If I have this up as a shield, it's not going to get started in the first place. So if I choose something natural, organic, like the Revitalize or Bacillus solution, very effective without having to use any chemical, okay? So there's a couple disease tips for you. The, the last one on there is crane fly. Now crane fly is that evil little mosquito on steroids that looks like a little crane that's skimming across the grass this time of year. And not to pick on her, but she is sitting there and plugging eggs all in your turf. Now those develop into larvae, which will eat your grass roots. Um, I've had a little bit of crane fly over the years. It's sometimes not the end of the world. Um, but if you have a lot of crane fly, um, again, it probably should be treated at some point. <coughs> Excuse me one second. I'm talking too much. So if I get crane fly, you're not sure. Maybe you don't know if you have it or not. Take a square shovel, go out into the turf where you think it's kind of browny, dig, dig a nice square up, flip it over and look at it. And if you peel into the roots a little bit, you're going to find those little grayish tannish grubs curled up. And that is your crane fly larva. Um, birds will usually find some of them for you. They find them in my yard. I'll find little peck holes where they found a couple here and there. And certainly at this time of year, <coughs> I usually take a walk around the lawn in the evening and I can find five or six and I'm raising my leg and squashing those little mamas that are skimming across and, and adding eggs into my soil. So um, crane fly is one to watch for. Uh, if you want to treat it, this is honestly the same thing. We talked about moles earlier when we were talking about getting rid of the, the food for them in our soil. If I use something like insect and grub control, this will, this will absorb into the soil structure and eliminate the grubs, the larvae, including crane fly. And again, this is chemical, but as long as I don't have my pets, my kids, anything out there for the day, I want this to go into the soil. So sometimes I'll do this one on a rainy day. I might suggest you do it on a rainy day. Let this wash into the soil immediately. Then you can go right back out and do what you got to do. So. This is a chemical synthetic one, <coughs> but one that certainly, if you use it properly, shouldn't hurt anything at all, okay? So there's your, there's your crane fly control. Um, if I mention just a couple things real quick and then we'll do some, some questions. Um, again, we talked about starting over and I just wanna reiterate, it's all about the soil. I mean, really in all gardening subjects I would talk about, it would be about healthy soil, means I'm going to have success. So if you are really making the choice, you bought the house, the builder put in and puts down one inch of good soil, throws down sod one year later, why do I not have grass? Everything's turning brown. Why am I losing it? That's because it's crappy soil, to be frank. So if I fix the soil, I'm going to have long-term success. And I really need a good six, eight inches of good, well-drained, healthy base. Water goes through grass roots develop, and I've got happy turf long term, okay? So soil is the, is the first step. And like I mentioned, if you've got, you know, questions and you're starting over, come down. You know, we can talk mask to mask around here, or you can email some questions. I'll be happy to answer them. I'm here all weekend, all right? Um, you know, we talked about the moles a little bit, and I bet you some people are probably shaking their head. Now, I, I will say one thing about moles is everybody's going to have different success. Um, I've had one person say his sonic spikes works the best thing since sliced bread. I put those down. I haven't seen a mole in a decade. The next person who tries the sonic steak puts it in the ground, and the next day the mole hill comes up right where the steak was. I mean, that is how kind of hit and miss it is. But always think of that gradual process. To me, it's eliminate the food source, try to repel him to the neighbor, sorry neighbor, and then... Maybe I've had enough and we're going at it. It's wartime and I'm going to go look at a trap, a gasser, 
a poison worm, you know, something to try to get him out of here, okay? Um, and again, whether we're talking about organic, synthetic, systemic, you know, I'll let you make your choice. I hope a lot of you choose to try to go the green route and, and stay natural, but whatever you use, you know, use it according to the label. You know, I'll speak as a guy here. Um, it's more of a guy thing than it is a gal thing. If the bag says, you know, put this down on 5,000 square feet, it is not going to work five times better if you pile it on 1,000 feet. You're putting extra chemical, especially when you don't need it. I'd rather have you save your money, your time, and reapply that again. You know, maybe you buy a bag of the grub beater and I have a small lawn. Sweet. I've got this fall covered. I've got next spring covered, and I've got the next fall covered um, all in one bag. Don't put it down more than you need. It's really going to do you no good. You know, just a quick side note on lawn food like that. You know, it, if you put synthetic lawn food down heavy, you will burn your grass. If we mention uh, the only thing we carry is organic here, if I use an organic lawn food, uh, someone inevitably will call me next week and say, I was at your seminar, I bought the lawn food, I messed up, I broke the bag, it spilled in a pile in the middle of my lawn, what do I do? You know, and I'll kind of chuckle and say, sweet, grab your foot and just kick it around a little bit because it won't burn. You know, if I use an organic fertilizer, um, I can do whatever I want and not burn. You know, I'm not saying to run home and do this, but some years coming out of winter, if it's been extra wet, I've got 2,000 square feet. I might apply two applications of lawn food in the spring because I really want to give it a boost. I'm not going to hurt my grass. I'm not going to burn it. If I put two doses of Scotts down, I would brown the whole thing out with too much nitrogen and I'd have to start over again. So lawn food, very, very safe to maybe ignore the label just a little bit. All right. So I would just ask at the end here, you go green if you can. Uh, try going the organic route. I think you'd be happy with the results. Um, and if you put in a little bit of work some time, I think you'd have happy turf, you know, going going, going into the, the winter time and certainly looking a lot better coming out for next spring, okay? So real quick, specials, um, like all of our classes here, we wish you could be down here with us. I'd like to see everybody. Hopefully next year at some point we'll get back to doing them in-house. But come down and do some shopping. You know, everything I showed today, is on 20% off kind of for the fall lawn special. You've got this whole week to come down and take advantage of the special, get your lawn food, get your moss control, weed killer, lime, seed, soil, everything you need to have a successful project here this fall um, as you kind of dial your lawn back in going into the winter here, okay? Um, I hope next week you might consider joining us. I'll be doing next Saturday again. Uh, we're gonna do fall containers. So I know for me, some of my annuals are looking a little tired here finally after summer. If you want to come down and kind of learn a little bit of fall container design, I'll be planting a couple planters here in the class, showing off a lot of cool plants that I think thrive through the fall winter season here. Um, and we get to talk about my favorite subjects for containers, the thriller, the filler, and the spiller. So if you want to learn about those three, join us next Saturday, all right? So I'm going to turn this over to Nicole. If she wants to field some questions here, we've got some time for questions. Awesome. Um, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. If you have to <laughs> bail out before all the questions and answers, um, I've mentioned it a few times in the chat, but we do record these and then we post them up on our website on our classes page. Um, that way you can go back, watch it again if you missed information or need a refresher. Uh, the handout is also up there as well. Um, the discount, like Trevor said, that's going to be available until next Friday, this coming Friday the 8th. Is that right? Oh my gosh, we're already halfway through September. Um, and just let the cashiers know when you're here that you were part of the class and they'll be happy to give you that discount. Um, we have a lot of questions today, so we're going to do our best to get through them. If for some reason we don't make it to your question, um, shoot us an email at sunnysidenursery at msn.com. We'd be happy to open a dialogue with you. We're going to try and hit some of these bigger generalized questions that everybody can benefit from. Um, so our apologies if we can't get to them, um, but please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, can you let us know one more time, Trevor, what the product was to get rid of mushrooms in your lawn? Onsan 20. So if I get, I'll get it up real close to the camera here, if I can tell. That's Consan 20, made by a company named Monterey. And this goes back, through, I've been doing, running nurseries 30 years. This is the only thing I think I've ever had in 30 years. If you have a lot of mushrooms and you want to you eradicate them, that's 
literally a hospital disinfectant. It does algae, mushrooms, all kinds of things, but that's the best thing for turf. Um, what do you recommend if you've got yellow spots caused by a dog doing their business out in the, uh, <laughs> in the yard? How do you recommend uh, making that turn around? Uh, for someone you? always asks me about the dog. Well, first of all, I'd probably guess the dog is a she, um, not to pick on the she dogs, but typically there's a hormone in female dog urine that kills off spots and grass. It typically doesn't happen with the, with the he dogs, but um, I wish I had a magic answer for you. If it's yours, um, ask your vet. I do, do believe still there is a pill that can be applied to a she dog that will remove that hormone and you won't have it happen as much. Um, if you've got the brown patches, I don't have a, a huge answer for you. You're going to have to probably go out at least spring and fall a couple times a year, maybe thatch or rake those areas real heavy to get the dead debris off and do a little bit of overseeding and follow that same process. Um, I wish I had a magic answer for you on that one, but um, I'm about ready to get a dog for my two boys. And so I'm setting up an area behind the house uh, that will probably not have very nice grass, but it'll be inside the fence. And there you can do whatever you like to do. Don't touch the rest of my OCD lawn. How's that? <laughs> We'll see how long that lasts from dog owners. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got some questions about if there are, it looks like different types of grasses all growing in somebody's lawn. Is there any way to kind of get that more uniform or do you just live with the different varieties all mixed in? Well, uh, again, um, I started out the class by saying I'm the OCD lawn guy. So I, I hit 50 this year and I, I have a five and a nine year old. So if I go back, 20 years, 15 years, 10 years before child, BC, right? Um, I walked around with my screwdriver and I popped up every piece of Poa Anna and all the different grasses you're talking about. And I didn't want it. I wanted just ryegrass and fescue. And I had the time to run around and do it. When my kids are out the house, I will probably do it again, to be honest with you. But um, I gave up when the kids got running around. It's like, you know what? I have no time to do that anymore. So I mow a little tighter you know mine's more fairway probably inch inch tall grass and i can hardly tell yes maybe there's two slightly different shades of green um and it does bother me sometimes to be honest with you but um if you leave it long it's going to stick out like a sore thumb you're going to have poa anna or bluegrass flat with all the seed heads and then ryegrass a little taller and you're going to have that uneven look um again it's a really tough one because when we talked about herbicides, we talked about selective, non-selective, all those different types. It's really tough to get a, a, a lawn herbicide that is going to kill one grass and not kill another, if that makes you know kind of point blank sense. The one that I mentioned earlier that does, especially in the spring, um, is sedgender. You know, that's got a number of different annual or seedy grasses in that label. And if I get that down there, yes, I will help suppress some of that stuff. But I'm being honest, I don't think it's going to be a miracle cure for you. Um, I know our seed is clean. You know, starting clean is phase one. But the issue is not you. It's your neighbor. It's the green belt. It's wherever else. And that stuff just blows in the wind. And you could do all you can to keep it out. And you're still going to get red in the face because I did for years. Why is that patch of poa sitting in the middle of my beautiful lawn? And yes, you can cut it out. Yes, you can reseed. Yes, it'll look better. But I think long term, it's going to be some work. If you're signing up for it, great. Um, you know, I will probably get there again here in about another 10 years and do it myself. But it, I, I, again, I, I just don't have a miracle answer for that one. That's a really tough one. There's a lot of annual seedy, weedy grasses that, yes, I can control some of them with a product like Sedgender or you saw the pre-emergent granular. If I get that out in February, that's going to keep those things from even germinating, those annual grasses. Um, it will help, but probably not a 100% perfect cure. Um, can you talk more about aerating? Somebody asked if they don't want to use the shoes, what do you yeah. think the best way is to go about it? And then is there a way um, to help it not be as compacted after aerating your soil? Well, the, 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 the key with aerating to me, uh, you know, I've seen the shoes. I, I remember using them years ago at my first house in Seattle. I don't think they ever remove plugs. I mean, to be honest with you, I feel great. They're not very comfortable when you're mowing. 
but you know, they will get holes in there. Yes, it will help a little, but aerating is aerating. And if you're going to aerate, you're either A, going down to a rental store like Pilchuck, Hertz, you know, any of those places and getting a machine, or I would say save yourself the hassle. It's not that much to have somebody come do it for you. Maybe you clean the plugs and do the easy raking and have them run the machine and do it for you. Uh, it doesn't take very long, but you, you, you really should be getting a power aerator. It's, it's, you know, bigger than a lawnmower. It's really heavy. I could barely get the, I'm a pretty big guy. I could barely get the thatch machine out of my truck when I tried it for the first time this spring. The aerating machine is just the same. And there's monster, you know, golf course aerators. You just want the little home version and it does very, very well. Uh, but I would look at some lawn services, to be honest with you, and say, hey, how much will it cost if I just have you come down and punch my yard? I'll deal with the cleanup. And I don't think it's going to be a whole lot of money. Um, I, I, I wish this guy that I'd known for years was still around. I don't think he's doing it anymore. But there was a place called Greg's Lawn Service, I think out at Mount Lake Terrace back in the day when I ran whites. I think it was like 40 bucks. I and mean, he would come down and aerate or power thatch for you and then walk away. And you just had to rake up the debris and then put your soil back out, seed, lime, food, and, and get it going again. Um, when talking about these different steps, you know, specifically the seeding and the fertilizing, um, are there certain lengths of time you should wait in between those? Can you nope. seed and fertilize at the same time? <clears throat> well, and, and that's kind of why I set that sheet up is, you know, again, don't waste your time. Most people in my 30 years go straight for a bag of lawn food. And that's not the end of the world, but I would rather have you get the moss and the weeds under control than apply the food. You can put organic lawn food, seed, lime, all down. I mean, that's literally, for me, I get a bucket, do the seed, do this, do that. I'm all done. Go get my compost or top coat, cover it all, and I'm done. You know, it's all happening in one day. If you're gonna kill weeds and moss, what I try to tell people is, you know, let's assume you're Monday through Friday, you know, working during the week here, um, hopefully staying safe. And you're like, I got some weekend time. Let's get this done. Well, sweet. One weekend, you know, this weekend, get your moss killed, get your weed sprayed. You've got the week to do a little bit of raking if you need to and that, or next weekend, rake it out and then boom, food, seed, lime, it's done. You know, if you can donate a couple of consecutive weekends, you're all set. If you're reseeding, I mean, if you're uh, basically starting your lawn over and you've got a solid four to six inches of new soil, yep. um, how much do you want to water and for how long? And then when do you get to kind of peter off and just do, like you mentioned, a little bit in the morning and then a little bit in the afternoon? Yeah, um, I would always, if, if you were starting from scratch and you've got no turf at all and you've got the soil base set up, make sure you've rolled it. Go get a roller you fill with water so it's really heavy and it's almost like you're mowing you're going back and forth and diagonal and sideways if you walk out and you think you're ready for seed i always tell people okay put your shoes on go walk across the lawn of the dirt at that point and look back do you have more than a quarter inch of your footprint in that soil then you're not done go get the roller back out and keep going i mean it's a little bit of a little bit of rolling to get it nice and firm and level and compact then we can do all the extra work on top of that, okay? Um, does that answer a little bit of that or should we keep <laughs> keep going? Yeah. I mean, the, the soil, you know, if, if, you, if you've got the footprints out and you've got it nice and level um, and you put seed down, we put the top dress, a little bit of compost. Again, I just want like an eighth of an inch, maybe a quarter of an inch. I'm not burying my seed with two inches of compost. It's not gonna grow. I just want that eighth of an inch or a quarter inch on top. If I do that and I wet it down with a sprinkler or your sprinkler system or hand water, it doesn't really matter to me. You know, I, it's not hours. You're talking about probably 10 or 10 minutes maybe of just soaking it down. I don't want rivers. I don't want puddles. I don't want anything running off. You know, say if you were doing this like this weekend, it's supposed to still be warm. You know, maybe we get a day of rain this week. You know, I would count on a light watering every morning maybe in the afternoon, depending on how the, the, the weather goes. Today, I hate to say it's brutally smoky. The sun's not poking through. We've got marine layer fog. It's all. So you probably didn't have to get up this morning and do it, but I would count on this afternoon at some point doing a light watering. Once we get, you know, I'm guessing two, three, four weeks down here and we start to get more regular rainfall, 
you're you're probably walking away for the rest of the winter time. And this would be the same thing if we were doing it in March. You know, we get a dry week. Yes, you're going to have to do a little bit of watering, but we're not running our sprinkler, you know, system 15 minutes a day and soaking it down twice a day. You're going to end up getting rivers and puddles and ruts, and you're going to have to go back and fix that um, after you're all done. Um, we've got some questions about bent grass or flat grass instead of it growing straight up. And somebody yep. specifically asked about your opinion on the product tenacity to help refresh yep. the lawn. Uh, and, and I don't mind. There's a lot of brand names, honestly. A lot of the companies have similar active ingredients. Um, I have not used that specifically, but that would be another higher end um, selective kind of grass killer. Um, sometimes, again, the landscapers or the lawn service companies have access to things that you don't as a homeowner. So if you really have a lot of bent grass, you know, quack grass, barnyard grass, we can go on and on. There's a zillion different grass species that may come in here. Yes, I think you will have pretty good luck using it. Um, and I would say again, fall, but you're also going to be doing this in spring because I think most of the people I've talked to that go for a higher end product like that have much better luck getting it in that February, Mar March time frame before everything kind of wakes up and gets going for 2021. The bonide insect and grub control that you mentioned, does it kill a variety of insects as well? Does it kind of take care of a bunch of them or is it kind of specific? It, it does, I mean, you, you'll see, you'll see everything, not that we usually have an issue with this side of the mountains, but everything from fleas, you know, on the grass to different types of grubs um, we carry a different product in the store called eight, just like the number eight written out, you know, root weevils. I mean, you can go on and on with different soil type insects. Um, it would take care of all of that. You know, I'm not saying take insect and grub control home and dump it underneath your rhododendrons to control root weevil. I would get eight, but in my turf, I think that's the best one if you really want to eliminate all those uh, non-beneficials in there. What are your thoughts on using corn gluten as a pre-emerging? Yep. Um, I use that at my house in my beds. Um, I have used it on my lawn. Um, I would absolutely give it a try. I, I, I want to be honest with corn gluten. Um, it, it's not going to last as long, you know, as buying something synthetic. I'm okay with that as long as you are because um, it is all natural. Um, the issues with corn gluten, it's a pre-emergent. So, again, if I'm planning on reseeding, whether it's now or spring, and I put corn gluten down, my grass seed is not going to grow. So that's the one caution I would tell you. Wait till it establishes, then use that as a good pre-emergent. It turns into great lawn food. It's an organic lawn food anyway. Um, that would be my recommendation is watch the pre-emergent. The other issue with corn gluten these days is price. And I'm not trying to talk you out about spending your money. It's, it's, it's a great natural herbicide and really the only one that I use. But since biodiesel has come up in the world, they're scooping up all of that raw ingredient. And I bet you 10 years ago, I could sell a massive bag of corn gluten for 20 bucks. You're up to like 50, $60 now for a monster, you know, 30 pound bag. And it, again, I would give it a try if you haven't, if you've, you got the money and you're willing to pay a little bit for corn gluten. It's a great product, but just be real careful with the overseed because it is a pre-emergent. Um, a moss killer that's safe around shrubs and flowers that you could even yep. use, say, on your patio. Yep. So that was the liquid. We want to stay away from anything with iron in it just to make sure. Just look at the label. If it's got any form of iron, walk away. That's going to burn anything it touches or leave stains. If I have the potassium, the liquid form, that is what I could spray on my patio. I, you said to me, I use it on my patio, my roof. You know, you could put a driveway. I have some people spray it on the back of their RVs, old campers that are in the shade. I mean, you can use it for anything. It's not going to hurt. Um, but this is the way to go. It's a potassium salt, but it's the liquid Moss Max, not the granular form. Okay. Um, if there's a lawn over a septic drain field, would you treat that any differently than what you've discussed today? Not at all. I mean, lawn uh, would be a great way to kind of permeate some of that stuff above septic. Almost everybody, I would assume, uh, I know at my place or our family place in Clay Island, we've had, uh, you know, prairie grass over the septic field forever because it's going to control a little bit of the erosion and keep it safe. I wouldn't worry about 
uh, that at all. He, especially, you know, again, going green, absolutely safe. Um, I would, you know, maybe try to avoid the chemical use, but it's, it's not going to affect the drain field. Um, okay, I think we've hit a lot of questions today. I appreciate you all staying late. Um, there's always so much to discuss and everybody's got, you know, individual issues and we would love to help you with those issues. Trevor here is here a lot. He'll be here for the rest of the day and the weekend. Give us a call, shoot us an email, come in. Um, we'd be happy to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with you to help kind of figure out what's going on in your personal situation or to address any, you know, um, unanswered questions that you may have. Um, thanks again for joining us. We hope to see you all next Saturday at our Festive Fall Container class and take Thank care, you. stay healthy. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thank you.